We've all been there. High school, day one. The challenge to fit in, to make friends, the struggle to find ourselves in the manic energy of a new building, surrounded by a sea of foreign faces. It's all too familiar and all too real. A time in our life most of us would rather forget. But most of us don't have the cloud of childhood trauma hanging over our heads. This is Charlie's Dear Friend Letters from novel-turned-indie film Perks of Being a Wallflower on Stories Telling Stories. I love coming-of-age stories. Novels, films, television, the whole lot. You see, I struggled a lot in my adolescence, coming to terms with getting older and the inevitable changes that begin affecting us on a much deeper level. Charlie is that version of all of us, played brilliantly by Logan Lerman in the 2012 film that struggled to find his place in the big picture when everything around him made him feel small. Charlie reached out to fellow shop class peer, a senior named Patrick, at a football game and was then introduced to Patrick's stepsister, Sam, with whom he proceeded to fall deeply and immediately in love. Charlie was absorbed by this group of misfit seniors who saw themselves in Charlie, in this awkward, shy freshman, and their relationships grew and deepened as the year progressed, but also came crashing down in an instant of regrettable teenage impulsiveness. Throughout all this, Charlie writes letters to an unnamed individual, known only as Dear Friend, explaining his trials and tribulations as he navigates the shark-infested waters of love, life, and mental illness as a high school adolescent. Would a Sam and Charlie relationship really last once she was off to college for good? Is the friend a fellow peer or a distant stranger with zero emotional involvement? And is Charlie's sister Candace the unsung hero of this whole story? Let's find out as we examine Charlie's letters from The Perks of Being a Wallflower on Stories Telling Stories. Dear friend, I'm writing to you because she said you listen and understand and didn't try to sleep with that person at that party, even though you could have. Please don't try to figure out who she is, because then you might figure out who I am, and I don't want you to do that. I just need to know that people like you exist. Like, if you met me, you wouldn't think I was the weird kid who spent time in the hospital. And I wouldn't make you nervous. I hope it's okay for me to think that. You see, I haven't really talked to anyone outside of my family all summer. But tomorrow is my first day of high school ever, and I really need to turn things around this year. So, I have a plan. As I enter the school for the first time, I will visualize what it'll be like on the last day of my senior year. Unfortunately, I counted, and that's 1,000... 385 days from now. Just 1,385 days. In the meantime, I'd hoped that my sister Candace and her boyfriend Derek would have let me eat lunch with their Earth Club. When my sister said no, I thought maybe my old friend Susan would want to have lunch with me. In middle school, Susan was very fun to be around, but now she doesn't like to say hi to me anymore. And then there's Brad Hayes, who's the quarterback of our team. Before my brother went to play football for Penn State, he and Brad played together. So I thought maybe he'd say hi to me. But Brad's a senior and I'm me, so who am I kidding? On the bright side, one senior, Patrick, decided to make fun of the teacher instead of the freshman. He even drew on Mr. Callahan's legendary goatee with a grease pencil. I felt really bad for Patrick. He wasn't saying the impersonation to be mean or anything. He was just trying to make us freshmen feel better. My last class of the day is advanced English, and I'm excited to finally start learning with the smartest kids in the school. Well, I have 1,384 days to go. And just so I say it to someone, 
High school is even worse than middle school. If my parents ask me about it, I probably won't tell them the truth because I don't want them to worry that I might get bad again. If my Aunt Helen were here, I could talk to her. And I know that she would understand how I'm both happy and sad, and and I'm still trying to figure out how that could be. I just hope I make a friend soon. Love always, Charlie. Dear friend, I'm sorry I haven't written in a while, but I've been trying hard not to be a loser. For example, I'm trying to participate by listening to Sam's collection of big rock ballads and thinking about love. Sam says they're kitschy and brilliant, and I completely agree. I'm also studying extra books outside of class. As it turns out, Mr. Anderson is a writer. He even had a play put up in New York once, which I think is very impressive. He and his wife might go back there after this year. I know it's selfish, but I really hope he doesn't. My favorite time, though, is lunch, because I get to see Sam and Patrick. We spend the time working on Mary Elizabeth's fanzine about music and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's called Punk Rocky. Mary Elizabeth is really interesting because she's a Buddhist and a punk, but somehow she always acts like my father at the end of a long day. Her best friend Alice loves vampires and wants to go to film school. She also steals jeans from the mall. I don't know why, because her family is rich, but I'm trying not to be judgmental. Especially since I know how they were with Patrick last year. Patrick never likes to be serious so it took me a while to get what happened. When he was a junior, Patrick started seeing Brad on the weekends in secret. I guess it was hard, too, because Brad had to get drunk every time they fooled around. Then, Monday in school, Brad would say, Man, I was so wasted, I don't remember a thing. And this went on for seven months. When they finally did it, Brad said he loved Patrick. Then he started to cry saying his dad would kill him, and saying he was going to hell. Patrick was eventually able to help Brad get sober. I asked Patrick if he felt sad that he had to keep it a secret, and he said no, because at least now, Brad doesn't have to get drunk to tell him he loves him. And I think I understand, because I really like Sam. I asked my sister about her, and she said that when Sam was a freshman... The upperclassmen used to get her drunk at parties. I guess she had a reputation. But I don't care. I'd hate for her to judge me based on what I used to be like. So I've been making her a mixtape so that she'll know exactly how I feel. Shit! Dear friend... I'm sorry I haven't written for a while, but things are a total disaster. I probably should have been honest about how I didn't want to go out with Mary Elizabeth after Sadie's, but I really didn't want to hurt her feelings. You see, Mary Elizabeth is a really nice person underneath the part of her that hates everyone. And since I heard that having a girlfriend makes you happy, I tried hard to love her like I love Sam. So I took her on double dates, and I tried not to mind that she loves to hold hands, even when her hands are sweaty. And I have to admit something really upsetting. But I am tired of touching her boobs. I thought maybe if she would just let me pick the makeout music once in a while, we might have a chance. And maybe if she didn't put down the books that Mr. Anderson gives me. Or she would stop calling me the minute I get home from school when I have absolutely nothing to talk about other than the bus ride home. I know I should have been honest, but I was getting so mad it it was starting to scare me. I just wish I could have found another way to break up. In hindsight, I probably couldn't have picked a worse way to be honest with Mary Elizabeth. We were all hanging out at Craig's loft playing Truth or Dare. I don't particularly like the game, but everyone was playing, so I played along. 
I had Mary Elizabeth on my left and Sam to my right. Patrick called on me. I fantasized that he asked me about the truth of my relationship and I unloaded all of my baggage on the group. But I chickened out and said dare. Patrick dared me to kiss the prettiest girl in the room. Looking back now, I know he meant for me to kiss Mary Elizabeth since she was my girlfriend, but I acted on pure impulse, and next thing I know, I'm opening my eyes to a circle of horrified former friends having leaned over and kissed Sam on the lips instead. What the hell is wrong with you? I didn't mean to do it, but I I can't control myself sometimes. Something will happen and everything is a blur, and then the world is standing still as I face the consequences of my actions. Patrick said it was best if I didn't come around for a while, because of some history between Sam and Mary Elizabeth that my actions dragged back to the surface. I asked him how long, but he didn't say. Dear friend, I have not seen my friends for two weeks now. I'm starting to get bad again. Things also got bad with Brad and Patrick. I won't discuss the details, but it came to a head with them in the cafeteria, and Patrick made the first punch. I'm still not clear how, but the next thing I knew, the fight was over, and I had a linebacker's blood on my knuckles. While I don't advocate violence, my seemingly heroic act of saving Patrick from a horde of meat-headed football players was accepted as an act of redemption in the eyes of my friends, who tentatively welcomed me back into the fold. Come on, let's go be psychos together. Mary Elizabeth got a new boyfriend. We buried the hatchet, and everything seemed to be good again. But somehow, it still wasn't. Probably because Sam was still with Craig. I started spending more time with Patrick. He begins every night really excited. He always says he feels free, and tonight is his destiny. But after a while, he runs out of things to keep himself numb. Then, as if out of the blue, Sam got her letter from Penn State, advising her to report to the main campus immediately following graduation for their summer session. And after all of that, Patrick could only talk about the future. Alice did get into NYU film school, and Patrick is going to the University of Washington because he wants to be near the music scene in Seattle. But he wasn't going to leave without organizing the best senior prank ever, having painted all of Mr. Callahan's shop tools bright pink. Everything was going so well for my friends, and I couldn't be more happy for them. Sam is going to leave right after graduation. It all feels very exciting. I just wish it were happening to me. Especially because ever since I blacked out in the cafeteria, it's been getting worse. And and I can't turn it off this time. Dear friend, I wanted to tell you about us running. There was this beautiful sunset, and just a few hours before, everyone I love had their last day of high school ever. And I was happy, because they were happy. Even though I counted and I have 1,095 days to go. I kept thinking about what school was going to be like without them. My sister finally decided to break up with Derek, and go stag with her girlfriends at prom instead. And then there was Sam. I looked at her pictures since that night. I like to see how happy she was before she knew. They were in a hotel suite after prom when the truth came out. Basically, Craig has been cheating on Sam the whole time. When I heard that, I kept thinking about the happy girl in these pictures because she didn't have 1,095 days to go. She made it. This is her time. And no one should be able to take that away. At her going away party, 
I wanted her to know about that night we went through the tunnel and how for the first time I felt like I belonged somewhere. And tomorrow, she's leaving. So I wanted to give her a part of me. So I gave her all of my books. I stayed up with her while she packed. We talked about college and friends, new traditions. She told me she saw Craig and that it made her feel so small as she was driving away. I told her that we accept the love we think we deserve. I told her that I just wanted her to be happy and how much we're alike and how we've been through the same things and that she's not small, she's beautiful. And just like that, I kissed her. But not the kiss of an adolescent crush, but of new love taking hold. But something was gnawing at me. A darkness that I could no longer shrug off. And before I knew it, I was saying goodbye to Sam and packing the last of her bags into the truck. And as she drove away, I felt myself getting bad again. I thought back to Sam and I, and her hand on my knee, only it wasn't Sam anymore. It was Aunt Helen, and I was a young boy, and it was Christmas Eve. I began to fracture and split apart. My mind began to drift away from this reality, absolved in the opaque blur of repressed memory. I was lost. Stop crying. Shh. Stop crying. It'll be our little secret. Stop crying. Don't wake your sister. Hello? Hey, Candace. Charlie? Sam and Patrick left, and, um, I, I just can't stop thinking something. What? Candace, I killed Aunt Helen, didn't I? She died getting my birthday presents, so I guess I killed her, right? I've tried to stop thinking that, but I can't. She keeps driving away and dying over and over. Call the police and send them to my house. And I can't stop her. I'm crazy again. No, Charlie, listen to me. What if I wanted her to die, Candace? What? What if I wanted her to die? Charlie. Charlie! Dear friend, I was in the hospital for a while. I won't go into detail about all of it, but I will say that there were some very bad days. And some unexpected beautiful days. The worst day was the time my doctor told my mom and dad what Aunt Helen did to me. The best days were those when I could have visitors. My brother and sister always came for those until Chris had to go to training camp. He's going to be first string this year. And my sister told me she met a nice guy at her summer job. My doctor said, we can't choose where we come from, but we can choose where we go from there. I know it's not all the answers, but it was enough to start putting these pieces together. I don't know if I'll have the time to write any more letters because I might be too busy trying to participate. So if this does end up being the last letter, I just want you to know that I was in a bad place before I started high school, and you helped me. Even if you didn't know what I was talking about, or if... You didn't know someone who's gone through it. It doesn't matter. It made me feel not alone. Because I know that there are people who say all of these things didn't happen. And there are people who forget what it's like to be 16 when they turn 17. And I know these will all be stories someday. And our pictures will become old photographs. And we'll all become somebody's mom or dad. But right now, These moments are not stories. 
This is happening. I'm here. And I'm looking at her. And she is so beautiful. I can see it. This one moment when you know you're not a sad story. You are alive. And as you stand up and see the light on the buildings and everything that makes you wonder, and you're listening to that song on that drive with the people you love most in this world. And in this moment, I swear, we are infinite. the end. I'm Eric R. Hill, and this has been Stories Telling Stories, a pop culture podcast produced in association with Seeing Red Productions and STS Media Group, written by a live studio audience at Milt House Studios in Milton, Vermont, casting around the globe to your frontal lobe wherever podcasts are found. Be sure to like us on Facebook for the latest updates. There's also a Patreon page where you can show your support and gain access to bonus extras for as little as a dollar a month. And until next time, stay whimsical.